It is time for us to begin this morning. I want to go ahead and, and get started because I, I've had several things handed to me just in the last couple minutes, and I don't, I don't want to, to leave these prayer requests out, and so I want to make sure I can, I can get them in. We're happy to have everyone with us this morning. We're very glad that you're here. If you happen to be visiting with us, we'd love for you to fill out a visitor's card and uh, drop it in the collection as it goes around so we'll have a record of, of your attendance. Uh, we're glad that you are with us today. Let me start with the arrangements for Miss, for Miss Goldie Crabtree. Uh, the family is going to arrive here with the body around, uh, around 10 a.m. That'll be for a, just, just the family to have a, a, a little bit of private time. And then at 11, they will welcome uh, visitors who want to come and speak to the family and pay their respects. That will go on from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., at which time the service will actually take place right here at the church building. The ladies are fixing food for the family. Uh, any help that you can give with that would be appreciated. Congregational singing, Terry Don will be leading that. And I hope, I know he would appreciate all of the familiar voices he can get. Might just mention, if you have personal items on the pews, you might want to take them home with you today, and you can certainly bring them back, bring them back next Sunday, but uh, the service is right here. And so you might want to take those personal items uh, with you. Prayers for the family. Let me mention also that uh, Bill Greer, who preached in this area for many, many years, has also passed away. That funeral is Saturday the 13th, this coming Saturday, uh, over at the Saudi Church Building. Prayers for Roy Pendergrass, some very important tests tomorrow. Prayers for good news for the Pendergrass family. Mr. Robert Baltimore is here, but he does still have some cancer on his head. They, he is uh, taking treatments right now for that. Let's be praying for Mr. Robert. Also, uh, let me mention these folks. Derek Burgess, scheduled for a heart procedure this week, but he's been very, very sick and even coughing up blood. Prayers that he can get better and have that much-needed heart surgery. Um, Sandra Hitchcock, asking for prayers. She is in the hospital at Erlanger with surgery. Leighton Smith has cancer, asking for prayers. Ben Harwood is doing better. Ben is going to be coming to the NHC this week, and so we're happy that Ben is doing better. Also, these are prison, these are requests from the prison this morning. Uh, Denise Frazier and family, she is the mother of one of the inmates. That inmate is just saying, my mom has taken care of my family for me. Would you please pray for them? The other one is Harley Moore, 16-year-old daughter of one of the inmates struggling with an eating disorder. And so uh, the workout at the prison... <coughs> Sometimes the requests are uh, very important to the inmates. Monthly meetings next Sunday night after service. Next senior eat out is Thursday down at the cookie jar. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the Howe congregation is having a gospel meeting Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night. Different speakers at 7 o'clock. And Bethel will be hosting the Friday night singing. Uh, on April the 19th, please be making plans to attend that. There are flyers out in the foyer. And let me mention, Miss Shirley Andreessen is moving. She's moving to Crossville and won't be attend. This could be her last service with us for a long time. And so uh, please, please give Miss Shirley a hug and tell her we're, we're, we're going to we're going to miss her, but she won't be too far away. Maybe we'll see you sometime, uh, Shirley. Uh, let me mention the, the card for Miss Minnie Lee Deacons again. Uh, she has her 100th birthday coming up in a few days. There are cards out in the foyer. Uh, please sign one of those cards, maybe a little note to Miss Minnie Lee. Drop it in the basket, and they'll be delivered for you. Trying to get just as many as we can. Birthdays. Uh, Debbie Angel has a birthday tomorrow, and Jackson Barker has a birthday on Tuesday. Happy birthday to them. This morning, Bradley is leading our song service. Charles Ray Rains is leading us uh, in prayer. Presiding at the Lord's table is Bobby Lloyd, 
serving the audience. I did this on purpose. John Lloyd, Ethan Lloyd, Aaron Lloyd, Ben Lloyd, and Samuel Lloyd serving the Lord's Supper. And the closing prayer will be led by Marvin Lloyd. No, no, Marvin, <laughs> Marvin Smith. Marvin Smith will be leading our closing prayer.
Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you once again, Father, thanking you for this day that you've blessed us with and for this opportunity, Father, we have to assemble here this morning to worship thee. And Father, we're just thankful for everyone here today that's in attendance and pray that you will be with us throughout this service. Father, we're also thankful for the beauty of this place we call home here and we're just thankful for, for that as well. And Father, we pray now for those that are sick or in need of prayer, and many amongst our numbers, Father, that will be having tests done, we just pray that they would get good results. And Father, we also pray for those that are grieving the loss of loved ones, the Greer family. Father, we just say a special prayer now for the Crabtree family. We're so thankful for Miss Goldie and for the time that we had her here and all she means to us. And Father, we just pray that you will be with Freddie and Rhoda and the Crabtree family tomorrow. It's gonna be a difficult day for them. And we just pray, Father, that you would wrap your arms around them and comfort them as only you can. Father, we're thankful for our elders and deacons here and we just pray that you would give them the wisdom to lead our church. Father, we're thankful for Brother Keith and we just pray that you will be with him Today, as he brings a lesson to us, we pray that we will listen tentatively and we will take those words and the sermon and take it out to the everyday walks of life. Father, once again, we're just thankful for all your blessings that you blessed us with throughout our life. And we realize, Father, that all these blessings come from you. And we're most thankful for your son who came and made this ultimate sacrifice for each and every one of us. Now, Father, we just pray that you continue to be with us through the remainder of our service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Turn back. 
back to 622. 622. Good morning, church. So good to see you all here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we, we welcome you and would like to invite you back at any opportunity that you may have. Uh, if you're wondering why I'm a lonely bachelor today, I'm sitting up here by myself. Anna and the kids and uh, Stacy and Casey went to Freed Hardeman this week to see Making Music. Uh, and Anna's uh, social club, when she was there, Phi, Phi Kappa Alpha won the whole thing, so uh, she was a, a, excited Excited about that. Uh, but last week, we began a, uh, a series called When Two Become One, uh, looking at uh, the Bible's meaning of a biblical meaning of marriage, uh, what the Bible tells us about the essence of, of marriage so that we can build our lives upon it and, and preach the gospel to the world by, by the relationships that, that we have. Uh, we looked at last week how in Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to be alluding to that this morning, uh, but we looked there how marriage, as Paul describes marriage as instituted in the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, he describes it as this mystery that has been revealed through Christ Jesus and, and the secret, the mystery in which marriage, marriage refers to is Christ and the church. 
We see the biblical meaning of marriage, the biblical picture of marriage is that it is a reflection of the gospel. When two people say, I do, and come together and are married to one another, the way they relate to each other, the way they bear with one another, the way they persevere together and treat one another is to be a reflection of how Jesus has treated His church. That's the meaning of marriage and the meaning that all of us as New Testament Christians need to uphold in our lives today. And this morning we're going to be talking about that. Uh, we're, we're going to look at that same reality from a little bit different aspect uh, this, this morning. Uh, how many of you shop at Save-A-Lot? Nobody. Or a few. <laughs> yeah, okay. A few people. But well, the rest of you, where do you go? Walmart? <laughs> so... <laughs> You, nowhere, maybe. <laughs> Great, grow your own food, probably. <laughs> uh, I go to Save a Lot. Uh, I also go to Walmart, but the majority of the time when I get groceries, I, I go to Save a Lot. There was a Save a Lot in Murfreesboro when we lived there. Uh, I like the low prices, and, and I think the, the food is, is pretty good there. Uh, you, you might disagree, but that's just my opinion. Uh, but what if, just a, a thought experiment here, what, what if? A, a grocery store opened that was closer to where you lived, a grocery store that had better food than save a lot, and a grocery store that had lower prices than save a lot. What's the most likely thing that you're going to do? You're going to say, bye bye, save a lot, <laughs> and you're going to go to this new grocery store. What, why? I mean, most people would do that, right? I mean, any logical person would, would do that it, to no fault. To no fault to them, of course, of course, most people would do that. Why? Why would we do that? It, it's because the relationship that we have with Save a Lot or Walmart or wherever you go to get your groceries is a consumer relationship. A, a, a consumer relationship is is built upon the needs of the individual self. It's one that it lasts uh, only as long as the vendor meets your needs at a cost that's acceptable to you. But in a consumer kind of relationship, when, when the needs, um, when, uh, when, when, when the relationship becomes more costly than what you're getting out of the relationship, it's acceptable to end the relationship. In, in a consumer kind of oriented relationship in, in that way. And, and, and you know, many of the relationships that we have today are, are consumer relationships, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the, more than likely, the relationship that you have with your insurance company is a, is a consumer kind of relationship. If you get a, an offer for a lower rate in insurance, what are you going to immediately do? Bye-bye, Allstate. <laughs> Bye-bye, Farm Bureau, or wherever, whatever insurance company you have. You know, we, many of us have consumer kinds of relationships. Now, the point that I'm getting at, our society today has changed so drastically from what we've seen in, past de in the past several decades to a more consumer-driven society that it has actually altered, changed the way that we approach relationships. Uh, I was reading in a book where a sociologist quoted this. I, I thought this was very interesting. Th this is what this, this sociologist said. He, he says, In contemporary Western society, that's America, the marketplace has become so dominant that the consumer model increasingly characterizes most relationships that historically were covenantal, including marriage, he says. So, relationships which historically, in the, in, in the past, have been much deeper and more committed and, and, and much more binding, have evolved into a consumer kind of model. In, in a, a consumer kind of relationship. And this person argues, and I would argue the same, including marriage in our modern, contemporary, Western society. Here's, here's the heart of a consumer relationship. 
Here's, here's the, the foundation, the core principle on which a consumer relationship operates. It, it's this. I will be what I should be as long as and to the degree that you are what you should be. That's a consumer relationship. Let me read that again. I will be what I should be as long as and to the degree that you are what you should be. That's like the relationship you have with Save-A-Lot <laughs> or with Walmart or with Allstate or, the, or the, 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 the many different kinds of relationships that you have out in the marketplace today. And the fact is this. The fact is this. The fact is that when so many people today, when they get married, they build their marriage upon this principle. I, I will be what I should be as long as and to the degree that you are what you should be. And that's the foundation of the union. However, we as Bible-believing people can't see it this way. God says something different about marriage, about the foundation of marriage in which so many people can't see and, 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 and don't comprehend. Uh, the, the, the Bible says that marriage is so much more than just a mere consumer relationship in which many, a people, many people approach it. The Bible says that marriage is a covenant. Marriage is a covenantal relationship. And to be disciples of Jesus Christ, it means to see marriage this way. It means to see marriage as a covenant. To be a disciple of Jesus means to treat marriage like a covenant and not a consumer relationship. It, it, it means to uh, allow the good news of Jesus Christ to shine brightly for all the world to see. By the way, I treat marriage as a covenant. And that's what I want to talk about with you this morning very briefly. Marriage as a covenant. The biblical picture of marriage, the, the kind of relationship that it is that's so contrary to our modern society's view of marriage. The Bible says that marriage is a covenant. And that's what I want to talk with you about briefly this morning. Okay, so let's ask the question, what is a Covenant. <laughs> That's kind of an archaic word. Uh, it's, it's not really, it, it's not a word that we use in everyday speech most of the time. Uh, and, and in quite a, all honesty, it's, it's not really a, a word, a, a, an idea that we have a, much of a category for in, a, in our contemporary society today. There's not much that you can compare this relation to and get this relationship to and get a full picture of what it means biblically. biblically. Uh, we rather we see we, we see what a covenant is. We see the definition of a covenant uh, in the very beginning. Uh, like we quoted last week in Genesis chapter two. And that's where I want to begin this morning. I encourage you to take out your Bible with me and turn to the second chapter of the book of Genesis, chapter, Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to read verses, as you see on the screen, verses 22 through 25. Genesis chapter 2, verses 22 through 25. This is the very first marriage ceremony, and where we see the idea of a covenant being illustrated. Look with me in verse 22, if you will. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So this is the very first marriage ceremony that we see in the Bible. Uh, and all kinds of principles can be drawn from this. 
Uh, but one of the major things that I, I want to direct our attention toward is I want you to look at the verb here that's rendered. In, I'm reading from the New King James. You might have a different translation. Uh, but the verb that's rendered be joined here in the New King James. If you're, if you're reading the King James Version, you might see the word cleave. It's the, it's, it's the same word rendered in, in, into English. Pay, pay attention with me on that word. That, that, that original Hebrew word uh, that's, that's behind the word be joined to or cleave uh, as is rendered in, in the King James. In the original Hebrew, it literally means to be glued to something. It means to be fused, to have two kinds of, two entities taken together and fuse them in a way that is remarkable. To be glued to something, to be fused together. As you look at this word and how it's used throughout the Old Testament and other places in the Bible, you can see that this word, be joined or cleave, that's uh, in the original Hebrew. Um, it's in other places in Scripture, it means to unite someone, two parties together, through a covenant. So, in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2, we see this covenant covenantal language that is surrounding the very first marriage ceremony. When two become one through the institution, the God-ordained institution of marriage, when two become one, what are they doing? They are entering into a covenant relationship. Marriage is a covenant relationship. So what's, what's, what, is a, what is a covenant? Let's define it. A covenant, like I just said, a covenant basically is a relationship. A covenant is a relationship. But, but it's not just any relationship. It's not like a consumer relationship or a casual relationship. It, it's, it's the deepest, most intimate, most glorious kind of relationship that exists. And, and I want to direct your attention to three different points that we see in Genesis chapter 2, verses 22 through 25. Three, three things that, that, teaches us, that, that it teaches us about a covenant. Number one is that this kind of relationship, this deep and intimate relationship, it's a stunning mixture of both law and love. A covenant is a mixture of both law and love. Uh, also, keep your finger on Genesis chapter 2, but turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 12 through 13. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verses 12 through 13. In this passage, we see God entering into a covenant with the nation of Israel. And I want you to pay attention to the language that describes what a covenant is in this passage. Look, this is the, from the New King James Version. Verse 12 of Deuteronomy 29. That you may enter into covenant with the Lord your God and into His oath, which the Lord your God makes with you today, Verse 13, that he may establish you today as a people for himself, his people, as rendered in other translations, and that he may be God to you, your God. Personal pronouns that are used in, in the direction of both God and people, just as he has spoken to you. So... When we look at this passage, we can kind of get a taste of the kind of relationship a covenant is. Uh, uh, when, when, when you look at a covenant, you see the language of love and intimacy with another a, a, a party that you are entering into covenant with. And you can see that by the pronouns that it uses. His People, uh, the, the text says that he may establish you today as a people for himself. 
you are now entering into a relationship in which God identifies you as His own. You are His and He is yours. And that He may be God to you. His people. You are His people now that you are being, now that you are entering into covenant with your God. He is your God now that you are entering into a covenant relationship with God. So that's one of the elements of a covenant that we see. A covenant is uh, about, is, it has this, carries this language of love and intimacy and closeness. It's, it's, a, it, it, it's a deep personal kind of relationship. But also, that's not the only element that we see within the terminology of a, a, of a covenant. You also see the language of law as well as love. Um, that's why God says, and into His oath, which the Lord your God makes with you today. Uh, we see the language of, of, of sealing with an oath to confirm the relationship. It, a covenant is not only a personal, deep relationship, it's a legal relationship that's binding and accountable. So, a covenant is a relationship that's more loving and intimate than a legal relationship, a, no, a normal re relationship that, that you would be, uh, the, a, a contractual relationship. A covenant is a relationship that's more intimate than a, than a legal relationship, yet more binding and enduring and accountable than a mere personal relationship. A covenant is a stunning, wondrous mixture of both law and love. It, it, it's a relationship, it's a kind of relationship that has the potential to be more loving and more intimate than any other human relationship because it's legal, because it's binding, law and love. One person says to another on their wedding day, I'm going to glue myself to you, as we see within the text, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, as an expression of my love. So, when we attempt to understand a covenant, we need to see it this way. It's not just a personal relationship, and it's not just a legal relationship. It's a wondrous mixture of the two that makes marriage, the marriage covenant, that gives it the potential of being the most intimate kind of relationship because it carries the ele elements of legality. It's binding. It's legal. Um, and that's the way, that, uh, and that's the way that, that Genesis chapter 2 pictures a covenant. Uh, also, a, a second principle here... Um, a covenant is not only a mixture of, of law and love. A covenant is horizontal and vertical, in which we see within the text. Uh, if you want to turn to Malachi, the book of Malachi, chapter 2, um, in, the, in the second half of verse 14 of Malachi, chapter 2, I'll just read it real quick. It, it says, Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. So, a marriage covenant is a horizontal relationship between two people. It's a relationship that a husband and a wife, a marriage covenant, enter into together. But that isn't the only direction that the covenant goes. We see a marriage covenant is much more than just horizontal. Um, also, if you look in the book of Proverbs, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, Proverbs chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, it says this, "...to deliver you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words..." And pay attention to verse 17. "...who forsakes the companion of her youth..." That's her husband. "...and forgets the covenant of her God." If you look in the context of this passage, it's describing a, a wayward wife. Uh, a, a wife that is, is married to someone but is trying to seduce someone else. 
so that she may have pleasure with, 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 with that person. And the text says that the way that it describes this wayward wife is that she forgets the covenant of her God. In other words, she forgets the covenant that she made with God when she acts in that kind of a way. So what does the Bible tell us? What do we see through this? Marriage, it's not only a horizontal kind of relationship that two people enter into. Marriage is a vertical relationship in which I am entering, when I enter the marriage covenant, when I enter this kind of relationship, I'm entering, it in, I'm entering into it with God as well as my spouse. It goes horizontally and it goes vertically as well. The marriage covenant is between your spouse and God. And, and that's why, you know, in, in traditional Christian marriage ceremonies, you know, you have a minister that, that um, quotes the vows to both husband and, and, and wife, and, and, and he phrases it in the form of a question. Um, do you promise this? Do you promise that? Yada, yada, yada. And, and, then the, and then they say, they look to the minister and they say, I do. The historical significance of that is that they are making this vow, not only to each other, but they're making it in the presence of God to God. They're making a vow to God to be loyal, to be faithful, to be loving to this person that they're entering into a covenant relationship with. So marriage, it's both horizontal and vertical. And what that tells us is that 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 means to break faith with your spouse is to break faith with God as well. Now, uh, let's look at the last uh, point in in which we see in in Genesis chapter 2. A covenant is a promise of future love. Uh, and, and I think this is so very important for, for us to talk about, especially in our cultural climate today. Uh, because when many people, when they think of, when they think of a wedding ceremony and, and, and the, purpose, the purpose behind a, a wedding ceremony, the, many people think of a wedding ceremony as both spouses declaring to the world, to whoever attends, how much they love each other in the present. That's the way that a lot of people view the ceremony itself. Like this is, this, is a, this is an expression of two people coming together and showing the world how much they love each other in the present. And that may be true in a sense, but that's not all the ceremony is about biblically. When we see the Bible and we see the real purpose behind the marriage covenant and the ceremony surrounding it in a biblical sense, uh, the, the, the purpose of the wedding ceremony is for two people to stand before God, to stand before family, to stand before society as a whole, and to promise to be loving, to be faithful, to be loyal in the future. I mean, that's one of the major purposes of the vows and the ceremony and the covenant that you make before God. It's not so much a declaration of how much you love this person in the present, in the present moment, but it's rather a declaration of two parties coming together and saying, I will be loving to you in the future when feelings fade, when circumstances are not desirable, when it's hard, for better or for worse, in richer, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. And seeing marriage that way, seeing the, the biblical picture of, of the marriage covenant, it helps us to make much more sense about what Jesus says, Jesus is teaching about divorce in Matthew chapter 19. Um, if, if you want to turn with me there, Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 9. Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 9. Jesus says this in verse 4. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason... And he's, he's quoting the, the passage that we just read. This is the foundation. 
For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, Well, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her, who is divorced, commits adultery. Now, we see that Jesus' basic teaching is this. You see it on the screen. The covenant of marriage, as, as we understand marriage as this mixture of both love and law. This is, this is, the, this is Jesus' teaching surrounding it. The covenant of marriage is between one man and one woman for life. And in this context, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is, is, is denying that you can just divorce your spouse for any reason. And he uses Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, as the basis for that teaching, that marriage is a covenant. It's this mixture of both law and love. Jesus is saying that marriage isn't a casual, consumer kind of relationship. That can, just, that, that can be easily discarded. Marriage creates a strong bond, a strong unity with another person that you declare with before God that may only be broken under very serious conditions. And you see that in verse 9 um, in the exception clause. And this teaching that Jesus makes, you know, I'm, and, and I'm not using it this way this morning, I, the, the, Jesus is not trying to bash you over the head. Jesus' teaching is not intended to harm you in any way. Jesus' teaching is intended to bless you and to bring about God's original purpose and intention of marriage. Because as a minister, I've talked to so many people and I've seen so many people, even in the church, who are devastatingly affected by divorce. Divorce is common in our society. You see it over and over and over again. And, and, it's, and, and it's heartbreaking to see that kind, of, that, 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 that kind of union coming to an end in, in that way. Um, and and, and this is, that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, look, this is a marriage covenant. This is intended to be one man and one woman for life. It's not a casual consumer relationship in which our culture today views it as, but it's a relationship that is supposed to be the most intimate and loving of human relationships, even when times are tough, even when it's, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult to love. If you persevere and keep pushing and keep fighting, it leads to, it leads to, it leads to fulfillment as both parties mutually commit to self-sacrifice with one another. That's Jesus' teaching, and that's what he wants us to understand. And that's what he wants us to teach to our children. That when they enter into this marriage covenant, how serious it is. And how, uh, how, how binding this most intimate relationship is. And I also want to say this, because I know um, there may be, maybe several of you have experienced divorce um, in, in your life. Uh, and, you know... I want to say that God, God knows what that's like. <laughs> Maybe you have felt that pain. Um, the Bible says that God knows what that's like. In Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 8, it says, Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. God feels the pain. God knows what it's like. And if you fit within that category today, please know this. You're, you're not some kind of second-class church citizen. God's going to shower you with mercy and grace and forgiveness if you walk with Him in repentance in the present. And that's what all of us need to be committed to, and that's how we need to see it. Uh, so what is the heart of a covenant relationship? 
The heart of a covenant relationship as opposed to a consumer relationship is this. I will be what I should be whether you are what you should be or not. That's a covenant relationship. I will be what I should be whether you are what you should be or not. And this covenantal commitment is a reflection of how God has treated us. As we close this morning, I want to, I want, I want to talk about one chapter in, in the Bible. Genesis chapter 15. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read it because it's, it's a longer passage and, and for time's sake I won't. But, uh, but what's happening in Genesis chapter 15 is God is entering into a covenant with Abraham. And, and, what, and some of the elements that happens are, are very peculiar. It's, it's a very weird story that doesn't make much sense to us in our 21st century contemporary society. God, as God enters into a covenant, a covenant with Abraham, he tells Abraham to take several different kinds of animals, cut them in pieces, and then arrange the pieces in a way where there's a pathway in which you can walk in between the pieces. Now that seems really weird <laughs> to us. Uh, and oftentimes in our Bible reading, we look at this and say, that doesn't make any sense, <laughs> and skip over it and, and go to the next chapter. But what's happening here is absolutely amazing and echoes the covenant that we have with Jesus Christ and how God has treated, how God has treated us. And, and if, if you look in, 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 in history, in ancient times, you know, God telling Abraham to do this wouldn't have been weird to him at all. Because in ancient times, when a king would make a covenant with a vassal or a peon or, or a peasant or, or somebody that was beneath him, this is how it was done. Animals were slain and the pieces were cut in half and there would be a pathway in which the lesser party would walk through the animal pieces and declare the oath of the covenant. And the significance of that was that if the lesser party, if the, if the peasant making a covenant with a king, if the lesser party were to break the covenant, then the same thing that happened to those animals would happen to him. That's the, that's the significance of, of, what's, of what's going on in this. In this. That's the background of, of what's happening. But what's so amazing and you, you can read this in the story. Abraham, he, he arranges all the pieces. He, um, um, he waits a while for, for get, to get direction from God. Um, and uh, the, the implication is that Abraham, Abraham's the lesser party, right? God's the greater party. God's like the king. Abraham's like the peon that uh, is entering into a covenant relationship with God. The way that this should normally go is Abraham should walk in, in the midst of, of, the, of the pieces. But that's not what happens in the story. Instead, and, and the, the implication is that Abraham is prepared to walk through the pieces. He thinks that he's going to have to walk through the pieces. And, and if he breaks the covenant, that, then the same thing that happened to those animals is going to happen happened to him. But that's not what happens. What happens is the text says that there's this smoking pillar of fire, or in other translations, a smoking fire pot descends from heaven. What is that? That's God, as he would later appear to the Israelites on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19. But God descends from heaven in the form of the smoking fire pillar. And what does God do? God walks through the pieces. That's unheard of. Every commentary that you read about Genesis chapter 15, the commentators are just blown away because that's not how covenants were done in ancient times. The greater party would never walk through the pieces and, 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 uh, and, 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 and declare that the same thing that would happen to those animals would happen to him if he broke the terms of the covenant. It would be the lesser party. What's going on here? What's going on here is this. By God doing that, 
By God walking through those pieces, God is essentially saying this to Abraham. He's saying, I will die if I don't bless you. That's what God is saying in Genesis chapter 15. I, may I die if I don't bless you, Abraham. And he's also saying this, even if, Abraham, you aren't what you should be, even if you break the terms of the covenant, I'm going to take on the consequences for you. As seen in the fact that Abraham didn't even walk through the pieces himself. And he did. God did. God did take on the consequences of breaking the covenant on Mount Calvary when deep darkness descended upon the world and the Son of Man was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. What was he doing? He was taking on the consequences of our rebellion, the consequences of covenant disloyalty to him. That's the significance of the cross. Jesus Christ is the hero of the covenant. Jesus is the hero of the covenant. He is what he should be even when we are not what we should be. When we fall short, and we do at times, he remains loyal. When, when, when we sin, and we come to him and, and, and have the spirit of, of, of repentance, he remains faithful to the terms of the covenant, even when we are not. Even Romans chapter 5 tells us that even when we were his enemies, he died for us. In that, that kind of radical, self-sacrificial, covenantal love, it's intended to compel us to obey and to submit and to walk with Him in repentance. Brothers and sisters, the truth is this. When we talk about marriage, marriage is not just about your personal satisfaction. Marriage is not about me. It's not about you. The Bible teaches that marriage, the covenant of marriage, is a reflection of Christ's covenant with His church. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, This is a great mystery, but I am speaking concerning Christ and the church. So from a purely Christian perspective, if we have a Christian worldview in seeing marriage... Marriage is all about showing the world who Jesus is. That's the meaning of marriage. And that's what God wants us to pattern our marriages after. The same kind of covenantal love that God has displayed and continues to display toward us. We showcase that love by showing the same kind of Loyalty to the one that we've become one with. When two become one. Uh, I'm, I'm going to end the sermon right there because uh, we're out of time. Um, but um, maybe you uh, you've know that you've, you're, you're, not a, um, you're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to... Uh, make that right this morning. Uh, you can come forward and you've, you've heard the gospel message. Uh, believe on Jesus Christ and uh, make a decision to go a 180. Repent. Go the other way around. You can come forward and confess your faith in Jesus uh, like Clara May was uh, on, on Sunday. Uh, thank God for her commitment and, and her example. And you can be baptized into Jesus Christ and begin a relationship with Him. If there's any that have need, why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing. Sinner Jesus will be
In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we have some instruction concerning this. Paul writing, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Bow with me, please. Our God, our Father in heaven, we thank you now for this bread representing the body of Christ that he willingly allowed to be hung on the cross that we might have a hope of heaven with you. Help us, Father, to do this in a manner which will be pleasing. We ask in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our prayer. Father, we thank you also for this juice, the fruit of the vine, representing the blood that Christ so willingly shed upon the cross. We thank you, Father, for your love, for the love of Jesus that he was willing to shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Help us to clear our minds and do this in a manner which will be acceptable. For we pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.
Bow with me again, please. Father, again, we, we thank you for the many blessings which we receive from you each day. Help us, Father, to, to remember and to know that what we have is only what you al allow us to, that it's your will. Help us to cheerfully return a part of what we have to be used to spread your word, not just here, but throughout the world, to do good. Help us, Father, to cheerfully give back. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all pray, please. Father, we're thankful we can come out here this morning and sing these songs and study and hear another portion of thy word. We pray, Father, that we have listened attentively and we can take these things out into the world and apply them to our everyday walks of life. We're thankful for the many blessings received and we know that they do come above. And Father, we Thank uh, Brother Keith for the words he has given us this morning. We pray that we can find the covenant of love and, and always love our wives and let them know so. Father, we're thankful that, that we have this beautiful day that we could get out and enjoy the sunshine and the beauties of the world. We pray, Father, that you would be with those that are sick, especially those that are mentioned in our bulletin. We pray that you would watch over them.
and bring them back to their homes as soon as possible, make their pain light. Now, Father, we ask that you go with us now as we go to our homes, watch over us, and care for us. But most of all, forgive us of our sins, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.